because there's corruption in every state. This right here is a photo of Terry Lewis, the 14th person in as many centuries to be stripped of their knighthood. He was the Queensland Police Commissioner and in 1989 was convicted of 16 counts of corruption and bribery, including $700,000 worth of bribes from brothels and casinos. Lewis was just one of a string of high profile officials on trial for corruption, including the actual Premier of the state, Joe Bielke Peterson. In his trial, the jury was stuck in a deadlock causing a mistrial. But how about this? In 1992, we found out the jury foreman was Luke Shaw, a member of the Young Nationals, Bielke Peterson's party, and had misrepresented the judge to the jury. Bielke Peterson was deemed too old to retrial, and when he died, we gave him a state funeral. That bloody National Party is the reason Kerr got me sacked. Watch out for John Barillaro. This is nothing but lefty lunacy. It's not though. This isn't a left-right issue. You had numerous undeclared shares whose prices rose as a result of your government's actions, plucked a police commissioner from obscurity who took $700,000 in bribes, and multiple cabinet members pled guilty to serious corruption. The courts found me not guilty, and so the woke media is just trying to slander me. I sat down with multiple AI-generated figures, who are long dead and therefore aren't actually real, with one question in mind. How on earth did we get a party with such a track record of corruption who are still quite relevant today? Now, before everyone comes in, yes, both Labor and Liberal have had historical issues with corruption. New South Wales gave us both Bob Askin and Eddie Obeid. But per elected members in the party, their strike rate is much lower. You've got to understand that when I started the Nationals, it was nothing like what it became. I'm sorry, your name is just so hilarious. Yep, me and Ted Theodore had the best ones. But you see, there were a bunch of farmers' unions across Australia. You had the Victorian Farmers' Union who won seats in the state parliament in 1917 and even won in the federal parliament in 1918. So after World War I, we decided, why don't we pour resources into one party, the Country Party, and challenge for Canberra? What did the Country Party represent? True Australia. Come on, don't give me slogans here. What does any of that even mean? Representing the 17% bushland of this nation. So when we federated, we had representation. Edmund Barton's protectionist party promised to tariff farming imports from other countries to protect us. And so when Deakin merged the protectionists with the free traders in 1909 to become the liberals and take down Labour, you felt betrayed. Exactly. We could never support Labour because they made our workers unaffordable. They would also listen to foreigners and communists and give them good deals. So the farmers actually had no political representation. So after World War I, the country party became a small minor party and picked up some seats in both state and federal parliaments. The main rallying cries were protecting Australian farmers and generally being quite socially conservative. If I were to ask you your memories of 1921, what comes to mind? Bro, don't even get me started on the second coming of Judas. Look, I mean, I know Bill's still angry at me, but I literally had no choice. He wouldn't listen to the party. So the 1919 election left the country party in a really strong position. You see, Billy Hughes' Nationalist Party, the new variation of the Liberal Party, fell one seat short of government. And in order to govern, they needed the 11 seats held by McWilliams' country party. McWilliams agreed, but said that this was nothing concrete and that the country party had the right to pull out. This basically meant that McWilliams was often very critical of Hughes and frequently voted against his government. It was the dumbest strategy. If we locked ourselves into something, we could gain real influence. Why do you think Earl Page took the country party off you? I did what was right for farmers. Page only cared about how the party could be more powerful. So Earl Page became the new leader of the country party in 1921, and in 1922, their influence only grew further. In this election, Labor gained more seats than Hughes Nationalists, 30 to 26. With Page picking up 14 seats, the country party could form a coalition with either party. If I said the name Earl Page, what comes to mind? A rat. Do you regret your move? Absolutely not. We had total power in that situation. Hughes was still a socialist at heart. After all, he was a Labour member up until the war. I made my demands clear to the Prime Minister. He goes for someone more conservative, and I get to be the treasurer. You didn't give in to the demands straight away. Of course not. But the dog held out until my party turned against me and put in Stanley Bruce instead. We took Bruce for a ride. He gave us five of the 11 cabinet posts, including me as treasurer and deputy prime minister. From that point onwards, there was only ever going to be one party we did business with. From the 20s until really the 60s, the country party played the role of the junior partner to the Liberal Party. In some cases, they even briefly held the role of prime minister. 
When Joseph Lyons died, Page became the interim Prime Minister and even tried to stop Menzies from taking over. Then when Menzies lost the support of Parliament in World War II, Arthur Fadden took over as Prime Minister before the independence defected to Curtin's Labour government. In the 1960s, when Harold Holt went missing, country leader John McEwen stood in until they presumed his death and then John Gorson was appointed. But at the same time as all of this went down, the country party was actually running Queensland. And it was bad. People say to me, Joe, why did you do it? And I say to them, do what? Tell me one way in which my government was remotely corrupt. Oh, and you'd better be prepared to defend yourself in court. So in the federal government, the country party was the junior partner in the coalition because they brought less seats to the table. In Queensland, it was the other way round. So Frank Nicklin was the longest serving Premier of Queensland and his country party was in total control in the 50s and the 60s, getting their power from rural Queensland farmers. However, he retired in 1968 with Jack Pizzi appointed as his successor, but he died after just 227 days. In this case, the Liberals then played the role of the interim leader with Gordon Chalk holding the fork until the member of Kingaroy was chosen, Joe Bielke peterson None of us took Joe seriously. We all thought he was a one-termer. I mean, he could barely talk. So get this right. Up until this point, Nicklin's reign of 10 years was the longest. During Joe's reign, the country party never even gets 40% of the popular vote. Yet even with that, his reign ends up doubling Nicklin's. You tell me how that's possible. And that's a point that's impossible to overemphasize. When Bielke Peterson came in, even the country party thought he was too much of a bumpkin to be their leader, let alone the leader of the state. Just like that, he tried to swallow the porcupine. That's what they thought they could do with me. And it doesn't work. My name is Alan Callahan, and I was Joe Bielke Peterson's press secretary. You were jailed for two years and pled guilty to misappropriating $43,000 worth of funds. Correct. But what I deserve to be known for is making Peterson electable. The fact that we called it the country party meant that no one remotely near a city would even consider voting for us. We needed a rebrand, and so I got Joe to call us the Nationals instead. Do you think it was the rebrand that got you elected for so many years? <laughs> you don't need to know about that. Never pressed on his government's practices, Joe frequently defected with that exact line. You just tell them for me, don't you? Not, not to worry about it. The reality was that Joe's party was never really that popular, yet he found a way to always get over the line. For example, let's look at the 1972 election. Labor won 46% of the popular vote, yet only gained 40% of the seats. On the other hand, the Nationals gained only 20% of the vote, but gained 31% of the seats. In 1974, it was even crazier as the Nationals only picked up 27.8% of the vote, but gained 47.5% of the seats. Despite being the least popular of the three parties, they could team up with the Libs to beat Labour and because of their seat count, still have seniority over the Libs. Labour were gerrymandering from right after World War II. The Biel commander was pure self-defence. If you don't know what gerrymandering is, it's when a government reorganises electorates to give them a more favourable outcome. For instance, if you know you're going to lose an electorate, you make that electorate as dense as possible to contain opposition voters to just the one electorate. It's a normal practice on both sides of government, but Joe took it to unparalleled levels. So Queensland has three categories of seats, urban, regional, and rural. The wisdom was that because urban areas had more people, they got more divisions. Joe argued that this was prejudice against farmers and basically mob rule. And so he added a fourth category, remote seats. Farmers supported the nationals because Joe was pretty cool with mass amounts of land clearing, and based on populations living in electorates, the rural vote ended up being worth about three times the urban vote. But people don't hate us because we gerrymandered. They hate us because we were good at it. I listened to your podcast on it. Ben just hated us because he couldn't crunch the numbers like us. There's a case to be made that Joe was more powerful than me. I mean, he's as guilty as the CIA for getting me sacked. Whittlem had it coming. You don't mess with Queensland. Bert Milliner died and he needed replacing. Obviously, they'd be outraged if it wasn't a Labour senator replacing a Labour senator. So I chose a Labour enemy of Whitlam's, Albert Field. It's not wrong. He got the last laugh and was bloody powerful in the 80s. I mean, the Liberal Party are just supporting this the whole time and letting a cowboy basically boss them round. By the time someone had the cojones to stand up to them, Joe had crippled them. The man that stood up to Joe was Terry White. Yeah, the guy who sorted you with that laxative. White was an anti-Nats leader, and when the Libs put him forward in 1983, Joe simply denied him the title of Deputy Premier and caught a snap election. In this one, the Nats picked up exactly half of the required seats. It went 41 to Joe, 32 to Labor, and then just eight for the Libs. 
It wasn't an issue at all. I only needed one, and so I said to the libs, if just one of you defects, you get a cabinet post. Of course, I got two to defect. By this point, the Liberal Nationals Coalition was over. Just listen to Clive Palmer, then a Nationals guy, talking about the Liberal Party. But you're a crony, aren't you? Certainly not. I mean, what is a crony? Are well, you a crony? Well, this you... is a lot of allegations that the Liberal Party throws about because they're desperate. Tell me about the Joe for PM campaign. I mean, not once was I actually concerned I'd lose to the guy, but yeah, it was pretty bad. If Fitzgerald doesn't take me down, I become PM. It's that simple. So in 1987, Joe took a leave of absence in an effort to leave Queensland and become the Prime Minister for Australia. Between Howard and Peacock, the Libs couldn't get their act together in opposition and there was no clear leadership option. Joe put himself forward to lead a coalition against Hawke. But as this campaign was going on, Four Corners published an expose where the Queensland police were on the payroll of brothels to turn a blind eye to their conduct and only prosecute their competition. In return, the brothels would sacrifice one worker per month so the cops appeared to be clean. So after the Four Corners report, the acting premier, Bill Gunn, ordered an inquiry into criminal corruption. It was only supposed to last two weeks, but as the leader of the inquiry, Tony Fitzgerald, found more and more, it lasted 238 days. The findings were honestly so bad. So the police commissioner took 700K in bribes, 10 years jail. Joe's health minister misappropriated 42,000, one year. His transport minister, 17.5K, one year. His press secretary, 43K, two years. Jack Herbert confessed to being a bagman for the police. And Peterson himself may have been found guilty of perjury if a young national doesn't end up as the jury foreman. So after this point, the Nationals' brand became absolute poison in Queensland. But here was the kicker. The Libs couldn't kick them while they were down because they still needed them. And so we then moved into a new era, the Unity Era. In the early 2000s, John Anderson and John Howard had a very successful political partnership. Now today, John Anderson is known for being America's ambassador for culture wars to Australia. But his role in rehabilitating the Nats was crucial. Unlike Joe, his image was clean and he almost never antagonised Howard. You've got to remember that in the early 2000s, at least outside of the cities, Howard was a popular brand, and so attaching the Nats to him really helped them in their targeted seats. Now, yes, Anderson's leadership saw the Nats lose seats rather than gain them, but as the extent of Queensland's corruption became apparent, to only lose one or two seats each election was actually pretty strong damage limitation. Now, in Queensland, the Nats were still the senior partner, but Joe had become so toxic to the Nationals' brand that they needed complete dissociation. And so in 2008, both the Liberals and the Nationals agreed to merge their Queensland parties to become the LNP. And in the early 2010s, they had a proper renaissance. So Campbell Newman led the LNP to a landslide victory in 2011. I've got a whole video on how it went downhill from there, but it's still a massive win. Then on top of that, the Nats gained two seats in the 2013 federal election and five seats in the 2011 New South Wales election. But between 2019 and 2023, they lost six seats. So, what happened? For the past 12 months especially, uh, the, the, the very public defamation case that I have going at the moment, uh, unbelievable, you know, that I have to defend myself from vile and racist attacks uh, in a social setting, in a social media setting. Now, I'm not going to get into Geordie's vs Barilaro. I have a whole video on it, and I don't think the defamation case made a huge difference in regional voting patterns. But the pork barrelling certainly did. Essentially, pork barrelling is misappropriating funds for political purposes. In other words, buying votes. So obviously in the summer of 1920, New South Wales endured its worst ever bushfires, and so rightfully, the government stepped in to provide relief. Except some of the worst damaged areas didn't receive a cent. So the relief package was worth $177 million. The Labor-held Blue Mountains had over a million hectares burnt down, but didn't receive a dime. But if you move just slightly northeast to the Liberal-held Hawkesbury seat, the Bilpin Fruit Bowl was given $1.23 million to rebuild damaged infrastructure. The only real examples of Labor-held seats receiving the funding were Cessnock and Lismore, who got 2.5 out of the $177 million, not to mention that the Maclay Valley Skydiving Adventure Park got a $10 million upgrade in the Nationals-held seat of Oxley. Part of the reason Geordies got sued was for allegedly mischaracterizing the way Barilaro called himself Pork Barilaro. Now, for a number of reasons, Barilaro's star seriously waned in the 2020s. 
Of course, there was the Geordie spat, then the arrest of Geordie's producer Christo, then he retired claiming the case brought about too much stress, then it became apparent that while in office, he'd set up a job for himself in New York, and then he had that row with the Channel 7 cameraman in Manly. By 2023, he'd seriously damaged the Nationals brand, and right before the 2023 New South Wales election, it got even worse for the Nats. Now, I'm not going to play the recording because I don't have defamation insurance, support us on Patreon to help with that issue, but on the eve of the election, Geordie's released a secret recording that had been forwarded to him. The context of the recording was a by-election for the marginal seat of the Upper Hunter back in 2021. In the recording, Barilaro appears to boast of pork barreling $100 million to win the election by funding yuppie projects and saying misleading statements. His final remarks were essentially that they threw everything at winning the election. Even though Barilaro was gone, he'd become absolutely toxic for the Nationals brand. In 2023, his own seat of Monaro suffered a 13% swing against the Nats and fell into the hands of Labor. But this wasn't the only corruption story of the early 2020s. In fact, a much bigger one actually took down the Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian. Check out how Gladys was taken down right here. 